got him. Uh oh. Howdy guys, thanks for coming out. We're gonna talk a little bit about Great Lakes smallmouth fishing. And if you guys like to catch smallmouth, and if you're heading up north to Lake St. Clair, Lake Erie, Lake Superior, I don't care where it is on the Great Lakes, and you're going, what do I need to bring? Do I need to bring my whole truckload full of things? About 14 years ago, I fished the Michigan Division BFLs. I do so because I'm addicted to smallmouth bass. I drew a Chuck Hasty, and he was well known as the guy, if you don't want somebody catching fish out of the back of your boat, you don't want to draw Chuck Hasty. I was excited. I like that because I got to learn a little bit that day from the front of the boat and Mr. Chuck Hasty walked up and he had two fishing poles and he had a tackle pack that big. And I said, you need me to help you go back to the truck and get the rest of your stuff. My boat's loaded down with everything from jigs to crankbaits to you name it. And I told him, I said, we might be cranking a little bit today. He goes, that's all right. I said, we might be going up shallow a little bit. He goes, that's all right. And I didn't know what he had in his, in his little tackle pack or anything. I just know both rods had a drop shot rig tied onto them. It was blowing out of the east. We had sustained six to seven footers out on Lake Erie. And I was crazy enough at the time, my wife's here watching me right now. She doesn't like to hear these stories, but Chuck and I said it that day. And we went to Peely Island on the windy side. There's a place called the Wagon Wheel. It used to be insane. Still is sometimes when they get there. And I pulled up and I told Chuck, I said, I'm not sure how we're going to sit here, but he started fishing and I start fishing and Chuck, he catches the first fish and it's on a little minnow bait. I don't know what he's throwing. Then he catches another one and I said, is that a fluke? And he goes, kind of. My biggest job that day was trying to keep the boat from filling with water as we're dragging across all these little spots. And Chuck catches another one and I finally catch one and then he catches another one and I go, is that a fluke chuck and he goes no not really and he kept catching them i was kind of struggling that day my, like i said my biggest thing was i was trying to sit on a spot most of those spots out on lake erie are 10 feet in diameter and if you ain't got your bait in that 10 foot zone you're not going to catch one i pull up and he catch one right away and i might lose one about middle of the day i go all right chuck what is that thing and he goes well this is a z2 it's kind of a secret out here the waves were so big that day, when I got off on the trolling motor to go net his fish, my boat would turn and waves would literally come in the back of the boat. Now Chuck had a top five that day. He finished, I think, fourth maybe that day. And he had a little 15 inch in a live well that he caught. We had trouble landing him because of all the wind and waves. I didn't have a great day. I think I had a top 50. Chuck literally hooked a four and a half pounder that would have won the tournament for him. And it ain't very often this, I've never seen this happen. The fish jumped out of the side of the wave as I'm netting it, and it hits Chuck right in the chest. Bounces off the deck, breaks his line, and we're both trying to tackle this fish to get it in the live well, and a wave comes over the back of the boat and sucks the fish right back into Lake Erie. That fish was worth about three or $4,000 for Chuck that day, but I'll never forget. When we get at the end of the tournament, I sat there and I got to thinking, I was like, now this guy just had a top five. He could have won this tournament, and he was 100% fully confident that what he had in his little tackle pack was going to win him that tournament now this is a guy that is a legend from the back of the boat all of us boaters know when chuck hasty gets in your boat he is going to catch fish so i got to talk to a couple of my buddies and i was like does chuck do that when he's in he's in fishing with you and they're like yeah had a z2 on didn't he he had a z2 and he had a strike king zero and they're both made out of that wonderful 3x plastic and i'm here to tell you there's something about it tackle shack's got packs of them tactical fishing gear we developed one that's kind of like the z2 a little bit different same deal stretchy plastic what you need to put in your vehicle before you head north and want to go to smallmouth fishing on any of the great lakes this works on all of them the first thing i can tell you right now I've caught more smallmouths on a drop shot rig on the Great Lakes than anything else I've thrown. Now, a drop shot rig works here. It works on the Great Lakes. I don't care where you take it. I catch more fish on a drop shot rig. I don't have a hook in this because I'm trying to be nice to these bass. Typically, when I'm out on the Great Lakes, I'm a Dobbins guy. That's a 743 Dobbins, Champion Extreme. I usually have about that much separation, usually 12 inches, between my drop shot weight and my hook. 
I'm a Gamakatsu split shot drop shot guy. That's my favorite. I use ones and one aughts. I usually nose hook this little bait. And I would say every single time, no matter what time of year and as cold as it is or warm as it is, fall, no matter when, I have got a drop shot rig always on my deck, especially since the introduction of LiveScope. Forward facing sonar really help this out a lot because now I can target them. Now I'm using this tactical fishing gear minnow, a baby Z2, a Z2. I have that every single time I'm on the Great Lakes, period. Every single time. In the spring's a little different. You got a few other baits you can use, but for year round, these are the four things I use. My second one, I am never on the Great Lakes without a Kitek. I use my color too. That's my favorite. If I'm only gonna buy one color, I'm gonna buy IU. Smallmouth Magic is always also one of my favorites. I like Smallmouth Magic. There's not really a color you can't use. Kitek does have a scent they put in their swim baits, and we'll talk about that a little bit here in a second. Anytime you're on the Great Lakes, you gotta have a swim bait. I don't care if it's summer, spring, fall, does not matter. You've got to have a single swim bait every time you're on the Great Lakes. This thing works in shallow water, deep water, every time I'm out there, no matter what. The other one, and we all know this, I got a little YouTube channel, so if you watch my videos, you'll see me throwing it all the time. Dobbins, I use 743s and 742s, I got a boat full of them. The Ned Rig. This little bait came out, and I got to tell you, I've watched fish get conditioned to over the years. The tube jig bite goes up and down on the Great Lakes. This thing is a staple. We didn't use to catch fish on plastics in cold water. About the only thing I used to throw was a jig and pig and a silver buddy. This thing is crazy. Smallmouth bass love Ned Rigs. They're a little harder to throw because you gotta slow down. The thing I love about fishing the Great Lakes and how simple it is, the good Lord made the Great Lakes smallmouth to do one thing, eat. He's not the smartest animal that swims around in these lakes. He's hungry. He's usually hungry because he has to compete for his food because when you pull up to a spot, there's a billion of them sitting on one spot. Sometimes they get a little moody. That will catch them. The biggest stringer I ever caught in the tournament was just one out shy of 29 pounds on Lake St. Clair. I kind of caught him on a combination of, I was drop shot a Z-Man TRD in the Gobi color. This little guy is so simple. Large mouth eat it, small mouth eat it, Great Lake small mouth every single day, no matter what. I promise you, you can catch a small mouth bass on any of the Great Lakes on a Ned Rig. If I only had one rod and they told me I couldn't use anything else, it would be a Ned Rig. My fourth is for fun. When a Great Lake smallmouth bites this thing, it will change your life. It'll be the only thing you want to throw, the Alabama rig. This particular one's a hog farmer. They got them over here at Tackle Shack. I start out with this thing most of the time just to see if they're gonna eat it that day. This is more of a cold weather bait. It's when they eat it the best. Yes, they eat it when they're schooling and stuff, but they do get off of it. They get a little condition to it. Great Lakes smallmouth bass are not conditioned to this thing. I don't care how many you catch on it. They're too competitive. The hardest bite you will ever experience is when a four pound Lake Erie smallmouth inhales one of these guys. I put them on brand new and lost arms on the first cast. It's incredible how much they commit to this bait. You will have more fun with this bait when they're eating it. If you find a school of smallmouth bass, and if you get on YouTube and watch videos of, of live scope, you're gonna see schools of crappies. You'll see schools of smallmouth on the Great Lakes that look like this, and you'll throw this thing out, and you'll have 50 of them attack it at one time. It is absolutely incredible. I always have this tied on. So when it's on that jig head out there, look at him, look. Uh, when it's on that jig head out there, it's standing up. And they can't stand it. It's still on the bottom. Bass do feed off the bottom still, regardless of what I said about the drop shot, they still pull things off the bottom. They're used to it. But one of the keys is that 3X plastic, once again, it floats. They can't stand it. I also talked about scent. I heard that Scott Dobson caught quite a few of these fish many, many years ago. I think I was 12 years old the first time I attended a seminar. I was at Fort Wayne Coliseum, and they had a tank like this, and it was full of rainbow trout. And this guy was throwing a beetle spin into the tank with no hook, and one or two trout in the tank would take a look at it. You know, and I bet you he made 50 casts, and every once in a while, every once in a while, a trout would grab a hold of it, 
And all of a sudden he picks up this bottle. Now mind you, I'm sitting in the front row. I'm 10 or 12 years old, I can't remember. He holds up a bottle of bait mate. The, the scent was game fish. It smells like black licorice. Uh, is anise oil is what it is. And he took that beetle spin he'd been throwing and made one squirt on that beetle spin. When he threw that bait into the tank, every single trout in that tank tried to eat it. Every single trout tried to eat it. And just to make his point valid, he picked up another rod that he had not scented, threw it out there with a hook, and a couple kind of paid attention to it and followed it and stuff, and he got one squirt of bait mate, threw it out there, and he didn't get one crank of the reel. They already had an eight when it hit the water. Scent on all fish is that important. Scott did a little demonstration. He put some bait fuel. I've been using a lot of this. He put that on a sinker, and these guys were trying to eat the sinker. The scent is incredible what it does. We get lazy sometimes while we're fishing, and we don't. We, we, we'll leave it on the deck and it's like, eh, I'm not gonna send up again. Make sure when you're on the Great Lakes, smallmouth, when you're inland here, you're putting scent on your bait. I used to do smelly jelly. This stuff smells like nothing. I guess they can smell it. It smells like nothing, but this stuff's revolutionary. Now it's, it's the new thing. I make sure it's in my cup holder on my front deck. I don't know how long it lasts. It's supposed to last longer. About every 15, 20 casts, I'll put a little dab of this on my bait. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. If you catch 50 bass that day and you're setting all the day, I promise you, you'll catch 40 instead if you don't use scent. It'll make a difference. And one of those might be a six pounder. And if you're out there tournament fishing or fun fishing, it doesn't matter. It'll put extra fish in the boat, period. Just make sure you're putting scent on Kitex. Kitex, the, the little tactical fishing gear minnow, they're pre-scented. They got amino acids in them, but I'm a Kitex guy. I love catching fish on a swim bait. But anytime you're on the Great Lakes, make sure you got one of these guys. I've been blessed to win six Michigan, Div Michigan Division BFLs in my career. One of them was on a swim bait. Uh, if you think you only need to throw that swim bait in shallow water, I caught every one of my fish on Lake St. Clair in the middle of Lake St. Clair in 20 feet of water that day on a swim bait. Now, I could see bottom, I could see almost every fish that ate it because I could visually see it was a nice calm day. Uh, but when it comes to, make sure you always have that guy on there, please. Uh, he's one of my favorite things to throw here. It's good in cold water, good in warm water. But the swim bait, that little Kitex swim bait is amazing. I caught every fish that day except for two that I weighed on that swim bait. And it was actually a 4.8 Kitex. Uh, slow reeling it, fast reeling it. You got to judge the mood of the fish all day long. Sometimes they want it on the bottom. Mike Graver talked about scrubbing it where you're creating. That's really good in the cold water. Uh, if you get on and watch some of my fishing videos, I fish Lake Erie, smallmouth when the water's still, you, you'd, you'd, you'd sometimes look at your graph and see it's like 32.3 degrees. And a lot of the smallmouths you catch when you're scrubbing that bait on the bottom, when you're working that Kitek on the bottom, a lot of those small mouse, I think he wanted it, uh, a lot of those small mouse, uh, their bellies will be scratched up from the zebra mussels. They'll have mud on their bellies when it's cold because they're sitting on the bottom. And the only way you can get them to bite, and a lot of times the only thing you can get them to bite is that little swim bait, that little swim bait like that, scrubbed on the bottom. So, oh, we got one. He wanted a little faster. And I'm not familiar with this species because I fish Great Lakes smallmouth, but I, everybody's telling me this is a largemouth bass. But you will see some videos. If you look at my videos, you'll see us throwing a blade bait and a swim bait on early spring smallmouth, and I'm scrubbing it. I don't want to scrub it on this bottom because he's got a few obstacles I might get caught on. Slow reeling it, dragging it on the bottom as slow as you possibly can. That's one of the keys in the cold water. When it gets warmer, keep it above them, make them look up, they'll come grab it. Uh, but those are, the, those are the four key things. I'm gonna talk a little bit real quick before I get into a little bit of live scope, if you guys are curious about live scope, about rigging. 
my drop shot. I'm going to cut this guy off real quick because right now he's got a center pin. Thank you, Kerry Fry, for putting that little bait on a center pin so I didn't hook any of these fish. When I rig my drop shot bait, I always tie a palomer knot to my drop shot, but I'll show you real quick here kind of how I do it. You pull about 12, 13 inches of line or more out and you get a big tag in. You tie that palomer knot like that and pull them through. And then you got a then you got a 12 inch leader hanging off the bottom. What you have to do, you have to take that line, run it through the top of the hook. So the top of the hook side, you got to pull it down. Now when you rig it, sometimes you got to straighten the hook. That hook stands straight up. You'll hook more fish because of that. Uh, sometimes if you're fishing in heavy cover, I'll use a, 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 a Texas rig hook and you Texas rig your bait, but no matter what, you always run the line through the top of the hook and when you pull it tight, it'll stand straight up. You'll just hook a lot more fish when you do that. Um, and I told you when I clip on my weight, I use clip on weights. This is just a little quarter or 3 16ths out. Like I told you, I always use 3 8 3 8 is a little heavy for the tank here. I run that through. I don't just clip it on. It's fluorocarbon. That bottom's going to wear out the fastest. Once you clip it on, double knot it. Just put a little granny knot in the bottom of it. It'll save you a lot of weights. But again, one of the major keys is making that bait stand straight up. There's a lot of guys that'll thread them on. I like them nose hooked. I think they're a little more realistic when they're nose hooked. But if you look, you'll see he's, you can look real close. I tried to use white because he'll stand straight up every time. And I do that no matter what. I'll try to stay out of the snags over here. But you'll see he's standing straight up every time. Got any activity down there? Looks like it. This also is a very good bed fishing technique. Very good. If you can look at that guy trying to eat that weight. It wasn't too long ago I was testing out for Scott's theory, or Scott, what he did with that drop shot weight. He put a little bait fuel on it, and I don't know if you saw that fish, he was trying to eat it off the bottom. This stuff don't smell like a whole lot. I'll put a little bit on the bait, a little bit on the drop shot weight. Immediately. It's crazy. He doesn't even want to let go. He said, wow, that tastes good. I think I'm going to eat it again. It's incredible. It's incredible how much that, that scent plays a key role in the fish's senses. 